Hello and welcome back, or welcome if you're new. I usually make more abstract and theoretical videos, but this video is going to be a little bit different because it's going to be a whirlwind tour of the IPA. If you want to skip the intro and go straight to the five minute introduction to the IPA, go to the time on screen. So before we get started, there are three things that I want to note. The first, the obvious. The International Phonetic Alphabet, or the IPA, is a tool that linguists use to represent sounds. It started taking shape around the 1880s when language teachers in Paris realized that their various languages use the same letters to represent different sounds, and it would be much easier if they had an international system with defined sounds that could be used to represent any spoken language. The second thing to note is that you don't have to know the entire IPA chart to be able to use it. No language uses all the possible sounds, and no language comes even close. You might have read or heard, for instance, that the Northwest Caucasian language Wabuch has 84 consonants, or that the Southern African Ta language Hon has over 100 consonants, including at least 20 clicks. And while that may be true on a phonemic, phonological level, it's a little misleading from a phonetic perspective. But that's not really the point of this video. If you want to know more about that, let me know in the comments. And that brings me to the third and most important thing. Phones are not phonemes. That may sound obvious, especially if you thought I meant telephone when I said phone. But really, I mean it. This is a very important point that even a lot of linguists don't understand. Phones are sounds, and phonemes are abstract representations of sounds in a given linguistic system. When using the IPA, linguists represent phonemes with slashes and phones with brackets. Here's an example. Ba. If you're a native speaker of English, you probably heard something that you would represent like this. But if you're a native speaker of a different language, there's a good chance that you heard this instead. Both of these representations are referring to the same sound, ba. But in English, for example, that's what a b sounds like at the beginning of a word. Whereas in Spanish, for instance, that's what a p sounds like at the beginning of a word, and a b at the beginning of a word sounds like ba. Anyway, again, the point here is that phones are not phonemes and phones are in brackets, whereas phonemes are in slashes. The vast majority of languages have only about a couple dozen phonemes, including both consonants and vowels. And most languages don't feature things like clicks or secondarily articulated consonants, which Boabach and Khan make use of. Let me know in the comments if you want to see a video dedicated to the distribution of sounds across the world and regions missing common sounds, like how Australia largely lacks fricatives like F and S and H, or how almost all languages lacking nasals and bilabials are restricted to the Americas. It's really tempting to dive into that right now, but anyway, back to the point. This is the IPA pulmonic consonant chart. You can think of it as a coordinate chart that can tell you what to do with your articulatory organs to make a particular sound. In the case of spoken languages, your articulatory organs are the organs in your mouth, throat, and chest that you use to make sounds. In English, those include the tongue, teeth, lips, and lungs. In fact, these are called pulmonic consonants because they all involve pulmones, which is Latin for lungs. On the left of the pulmonic consonant chart, you have the labial sounds, which are made using both lips. Think English P, B, and M. And then moving back in the mouth slightly, you have F and V, made with the teeth and the upper lip only. If you speak any other languages, you might be familiar with fa and va. They may sound like F or V, but fa and va are made with both of the lips only, no teeth at all. Similarly, ma is like ma, but made with the teeth and the upper lip. Moving up and down the chart, we find the different manners of articulation, or ways of producing sounds. You'll notice there's very little difference between b and m, the main difference being that m is nasal, meaning that the sound is made by allowing air to escape through the nose. As we move right on the chart and back in the mouth, we find similar differences for d and n. The grayed out boxes indicate sounds that have been deemed impossible. For instance, a voice glottal stop isn't possible because voice consonants, by definition, require voicing, which is produced by vibrating the glottis. You can't stop air from leaving your lungs with your glottis while at the same time pushing air through it and vibrating it. The last thing to note about the standard IPA pulmonic consonant chart is that there's a lot of white space. I point this out because it's a good segue to the diacritics and other portions of the chart below, but also to stress that you really don't have to memorize every symbol. Don't let the chart scare you. Just know that the different symbols represent specific sounds, and honestly, you can always refer back to the chart if you need to. 
I honestly think the chart is a bit clunky, and if I could make my own version, I know there are several things I would do differently. Let me know in the comments if you want a video on that. Anyway, so the last few things. Non-pulmonic consonants. They're transposed, so sideways, compared to the chart of pulmonic consonants. In the first row, there are the different manners. Click, ejective, and implosive. And going down the standard non-pulmonic consonant chart is like going from left to right on the pulmonic consonant chart. For comparison, this is how the non-pulmonic consonant chart is set up on Wikipedia. You could think of the ejective consonants as being diacritics, since they use the same symbol as the pulmonic consonants. Most of the diacritics go above or below, but a few, like these, are like ejectives, in that they're represented with an additional symbol. And there's also other symbols. And then there's vowels. You can think of this as a coordinate chart too. As you move left to right, you move front to back in the mouth. If you try going repeatedly between E and U, you'll feel your tongue high up in the mouth, moving back to front. Do it with me. E -u -e -u. You'll also notice that your lips are round for U, but not for E. If you keep your lips round, but do it again, you can make the round counterpart to E, which is U. As you move up and down the vowel chart, you open and close your mouth, which is why they're called close and open vowels. You can feel the difference between open and closed vowels by going back and forth between E and A, or U and A. One of my favorite ways to interact with this chart is this website called the Pink Trombone. You can use it to simulate speech sounds by messing with the different places and kinds of articulation. It's one of the best interactive representations of the IPA because you can really get a visual sense for how moving the tongue changes the sound. Like always, links and sources in the YouTube video description. The last category on the chart are the supersegmental features like tone and length. They're called supersegmental because they're an additional layer of information on the segment, usually information related to length or pitch. Unlike diacritics, these symbols don't modify a segment, but they specify a contrast between what is otherwise the exact same segment. A short E is different from a long E only in the amount of time, the relative duration of the sound, and a high E contrasts with a low E only in the relative pitch. And I do want to stress that this is relative pitch, not absolute pitch. In isolation, it's generally much harder to distinguish level tones. For example, when I say E with a high tone, E, I might be saying it at a lower absolute pitch than your low E, but since my low E is lower than my high E, they can be distinguished. Languages tend to have contour tones if they have more than a couple of tones because contours are easier to tell apart, even in isolation. Languages with more than two level tones do exist. Cantonese and Vietnamese, for example, the 18th and 21st most commonly spoken languages in terms of total speakers, both have at least six tones. But languages like these tend to use contours and other cues to tell their tones apart. And even in cases like Cantonese with at least three level tones, high, mid, and low, speakers can't consistently tell their level tones apart in isolation because they're hard to distinguish without context. Anyway, so that just about wraps up this quick look at the IPA chart. I hope you learned a thing or two. Let me know what you think, and if you have topics you want me to cover in the future, thanks for watching, and a special thanks to my supporters on Kamuno. If you don't know what Kamuno is, it's basically a language-themed Patreon that allows you to support creators with the money that you've earned by practicing your language on the platform. I'm actually the founder of Kamuno, and the app is still in its early stages, but I'd love it if you checked it out and let me know what you think. In any case, this has been Seed for the Language Corner. Stay humble, stay curious, and I'll see you next time.